And I will now hand you over to the capable hands of Pastor Ronnie. You know, this evening we're going to do a study or talk about, discuss sound doctrine. And in effect, sound doctrine doesn't only cover biblical, a biblical sense of doctrine, it also covers music as well. You know, a lot of people actually forget that people who actually perform as musicians and singers are literally evangelists. They're evangelizing through instruments. They're evangelizing through the through the, through the word. Yes. It, 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 in song, and you know, I personally, myself, don't feel that a lot of these modern songs, brother here, I don't believe that they're gospel music at all. Because gospel music is supposed to be uplifting, number one. It's supposed to move in, number two. It's supposed to move in the direction of wanting to, pr feeling to praise the Lord. It's supposed to encourage you, give you a, a desire to pray. Yes. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of the, the modern stuff doesn't do that. Because I just cannot feel the Holy Spirit behind a lot of this modern music that is being sung today. Yeah. And I really do believe because many of those individuals that are actually singing a lot of these modern gospel songs, they're not converted. They are in it for the money. I'm sorry to sound like that. Yeah. And so there's no real anointing. I mean, a, a, a certain gentleman that I know, before he actually began, he, he's also a musician, he was a very popular musician in the world. He was a Rastafarian, then he got converted, came to Christ. And has actually compiled a whole lot of CDs and he actually teaches music as well. But before he actually cut one gospel CD, he went to Bible college for three years to study the Bible in and out. And then after he had passed his examinations at Bible school, he then went out to become a gospel singer. You see? Yes. But unfortunately, many of these singers, it's like everything else, Brother Young. A lot of lay preachers today, they don't spend time to learn the Bible, to study the Bible. They don't do any serious biblical study. And so that is one of the reasons why there's so much confusion and why the world is in such a state because many of these so-called preachers who are preaching the gospel today have not had any proper or specific biblical training. So they are doing things the best they know how, but it's not good enough. Yes, I hear you. You know, the scripture makes it quite clear Study, you know, God will not accept anyone or anyone into the ministry except their first of all study. The scripture says in the book of Timothy, I believe it's 2 Timothy 2.15, I believe it's that, or 3.15, one of the two, that it says, study to show yourself approved unto right. God. Yes, a workman that, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So one of the quality, yes, it, it's, what is it, 2 Timothy 2.15, yes? Yes. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And on many of these gospel series, when you sit down and listen to the message behind the music, you'll find that the message many times is out of sync with the word of God. Yes, I have to agree with that. So hence that's why a lot of these modern songs, I do not call them gospel at all. In fact, I categorize them in the same category as secular music. No difference. In, in, in other words, philosophical music, but not gospel. Because gospel is good news, and gospel, to qualify as someone operating in the gospel, you've got to ensure that you're doing it according to the book, according to the Bible. Other than that, it's not gospel, it's secular. And that's why it's almost impossible, Brother here for many people to, to, to get saved, or to have an experience of God listening to many of these modern, modern type of gospel music. I remember going back in the day, 30, 40 years ago, you got, and I'm proud to call the names of people such like Andre Crouch. I'm proud to call the name of singers such as, as Shirley Caesar, uh, such as the, the Mighty Cloud of Joy, yeah. and that category of people. Because when you sat down and you listened to a mom and pop, white and the wine and yes, so forth, yes, when you wine. sat down and listened to those, those type of, those ca category of music, you can feel the power of God in it. Yes. Those, those type of music will get you to your knees yes. because it's based on scripture, based on gospel. But on these, as I said, these modern, modern stuff, I, I many times overlook them and I ask God to forgive many times the performers, those who perform. Uh, and, and anyway, correct me straight. Anyway, we're not onto that today. We're actually talking about sound, sound doctrine, but in effect, it does cover gospel music as well. So I would say to Christians, 
It doesn't mean because something's got gospel on the tin that it's gospel inside. <laughs> the Bible said to prove all things. Mm. Prove all things. Prove all things. Praise the name oh, of the yeah. Lord. Because uh, another method that Satan actually uses to indoctrinate people and to teach false truths is through gospel music. So we have to be careful. Just like how we would not attend certain categories of churches, it's the same way we should not purchase certain types of music. If, for example, that certain type of gospel music is not in line with scripture. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, let's continue on with our study anyway. With sound doctrine. If we could, let's go straight into it. Praise the okay, name of the Lord. Thank you. Lesson number 34. And as you have the title, Sound Doctrine. Question number one. What is the meaning of the word doctrine? Well, doctrine comes from the Greek word didache meaning that which is taught or simply a teaching so didache a greek word um doctor comes from a greek word um, by the name of didache meaning that which is taught or simply a teaching in other words teaching praise the name of the lord yes praise the lord thank you question number two does it make any difference what we believe proverbs 23 verse 7 and the first clause says for as a man thinketh in his heart so is he. So if an individual's actually been taught along certain lines and believes along a certain lines, then they'll actually behave along the line they've been taught to it. A good example is the Sabbath. A good example is Christmas. Many individuals, even though we know that, that Christmas has origins in, in paganism, everyone knows that. Any biblical study, any biblical scholar will tell you the same thing. Anyone who studied the Bible will know that a lot of the, the festivities that Christians keep up today are were birthed in, in paganism. Yeah? And so a lot of you know Christians unknowingly defend a lot of time paganistic practices. And it's because of what they've been taught, you see? Yeah. So the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So you can only operate on the level at which you've been taught. And it's so difficult to break or to take a person away from tradition. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, In vain do they worship me, teaching for tradition the commandments of men. Amen? So it's very important in what an individual believes. I'd also like to quote you Acts 18, verses 24 through to 26. And it reads, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to, came to Ephesus, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Praise the name of the Lord. So, so here you, you've got a Jew named Apollos an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures he's preaching on and on, he only knows about the baptism of John so his knowledge was restricted yes so basically because his knowledge was restricting restricted he was not giving people the full dose of gospel medicine or of good news medicine so what happened there we found that Aquila and Priscilla who were actually pastors church leaders took him apart to one side and expounded onto him the way of God more perfectly. So what, yes, so he was preaching, but what he was preaching was not 100%. So Aquila and the Pris Priscilla put him to one side and, you know, sort shape him up, get him into shape, sort him out, you know, so just to ensure that he's preaching the full gospel as what he should, should, should preach. Uh, I'd also like to quote you Romans 10 and verse 17. It says, so then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Um, so, so in other words, we've got also got to be very careful as what to we what we hear, how we hear, and ensure that we also check all things to ensure that what we are being taught is in line with the word of God. It's pretty amazing how many people today just go along with what their teachers tell them, or their pastors, or their ministers, etc., 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 Tell them, but they never take any time to, to after a message has been preached to, to 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 write down what scriptures are quoted and what scriptures are lined up line upon line precept upon precept. You'd be amazed at how few people 
go home and then really go through what they've heard in church to weigh up as to whether what the pastor evangelist or teacher has said is factual. You'll also be amazed at the, the, the small amount of individuals within churches who will actually ask questions in church or ask the pastor to expound something in more detail. It seems to me that people in this day and age have a very small or limited appetite for the things of God. And, and it seems like everybody is just prepared to follow whoever says whatever without checking out to see whether it's true. You see, in order to be a good steward of God's word, you've got to match line upon line, scripture upon scripture, here a little and there a little. Many times to get the complete milk and meat of the word of God. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Question number three. Were the believers in the early church particular about what they believed? Now, Acts 17 and verse 11. So the question was, can you read that again, please? I certainly can. Were the believers in the early church particular about what they believed? Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. And it reads as follows. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than, the than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So here we can see the early church were very particular about the, what they were being taught, because in fact our eternal salvation hangs on to some extent, to, to a large extent, on what we've been taught, on what we accept as the gospel truth. So we can see that Paul here ministered to two churches, he ministered to several churches, but two of the churches that he actually ministered to, he made comment that the, 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 the church at Beria were no more noble or wiser, in other words, or more determined in the word of God than those in, in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness, willing to receive it, but also they searched the scriptures every day, whether those things were so. And it's also important that Christians dedicate a certain amount of time every day to study the Bible, to read the Bible, to go through the Bible. In the morning, you should read at least twice a day in the morning, before you go out to work, or if, for example, you know, you're, you're a bit like me, you get up early, you're in a rush, and then you've got to go, then on your way to work, as you're traveling, be reading your Bible on your way to work, and then in the night before you go to bed, before you go to bed at night, you should also read a few scriptures, read the scriptures through. In other words, the, the, the word of God is our bread, it, it's our sustenance that, that we need to survive. So, so it's so important. So, so the, the church of Thessalonica, the church of Beria, in other words, sets as an example here. Because basically, they, 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 they give us an example in that they, they read the scriptures daily, and also in connection with what they were being taught by their pastors, they actually, when they went home, they checked it out to see if what, they were, what the pastor had told them were true. So in other words, they took biblical study, biblical research seriously. As people of God and as children of God, we need to take the Bible seriously take it very, very seriously and apply it to our lives. The Lord expects us to take it seriously. You know, one of the major downfalls of the Jewish people during the time of Jesus Christ to rather on earth, and what he condemned them for is that they did not know the time of his coming. They had not researched the scriptures properly. They had not looked into the Bible properly so that when he arrived, they were not aware of who he was. And he, he actually, you know, rebuked them for not knowing who he was, not knowing that he had arrived through their lack of knowledge of scripture. So it's so important. The Lord expects us to make scripture our daily focus and to look into the Bible and to take it on seriously as, our, as we would do our full-time daily work and to handle the word of God carefully. Amen? Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you. Question number four. What was Paul's admonition regarding what we believe? 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21. Paul said his, admonin his admonition regarding what we believe was as follows in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21. Paul said, prove all things, 
that we, we've got a duty in the sight, in the presence of God, to prove all things. So the Lord just doesn't want us to take on what we've been told, just like that. He wants us to prove it, go into the scripture, look into the scriptures and see if what you're being taught are facts or fiction. Prove all things. And then to, secondly, on top of that, to hold fast that which is good. If you receive truth, if you've received revelation, knowledge or, or truth, through the scriptures, through God, through the Holy Spirit, through the Word, God expects you to hold fast that which is good, not to let it go. Because why, why is the emphasis on holding fast? I'll tell you why. Because there are many false prophets, many, many voices gone out into the world. So, so in order that we were not sidetracked or road railed, God expects us to hold fast that which is good. In other words, block out of our minds, block out of our ears, anything that will cause us to lose the truth of the gospel. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Question number five. What did Peter say about what we believe? First Peter 3, verse 15. Peter said, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So I'm going to read that again. He said, First Peter 3 verse 15. Peter said, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. In other words, have reverence to God in your heart. In other words, respect God's things, the things of God. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, I'm quite, I, you know, this ties in with a situation that developed during my working day today. And you know, God works all things out for a reason and for a purpose. You know, nothing happens in the Christian's life by chance. I was supposed to, during my daily work, you know, I work as a support worker. Um, you know, yes, I, I work as well as minister. I've got a, a my bread. Um, not as probably, you know, uh, uh, as fortunate as, as many other pastors, but God is still good. And I needed to see someone, but the individual was supposed to come with me on that visit, got ill and had to go home from work. So I had to frantically search for someone else to, to accompany me on the visit, because on our first visit to, to an unknown address, we always going to, because you never know who you're going to find behind the door. Yes. Yeah. Right? You never know. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, no one could come in, and I phoned around, and someone from me said, uh, one of my colleagues, Ron, I will come with you. I'll come, I'll meet you there, I'll come with you. Now, on the way back, uh, so I made my way there, I met her there. On the way back, she gave me a lift down to, to uh, Hammersmith, or to a local location in, in, in the UK. She gave me a lift down in their car. And um, as we parked up the car, I was coming out, she was going to the office, I was going off to, 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 to visit my sister. As we were coming out the car, she said to me, you know something, a lot, I know it's quite amazing because when I was thanking her for coming, for agreed to come with me on the visit earlier on, just before the visit to me, I said, oh, you know, God bless you and so forth, I was saying to her. And she said, oh, don't speak to me in parables, Ronald, don't speak to me in parables. And I said, no, but it's true. I said, I said, I said, I said eh, you know, you can always tell your friends. And I was, you know, but she, she, she thought that I was quoting parable to her. And I just said, okay, I apologize, but I said, God bless you anyway. And then, <laughs> and then, on the way, and it's quite amazing because when you're full of God, many times we even speak gospel and we don't realize. Don't know, it just comes out. Yeah, it just comes out and just yeah. says to me, don't speak parables to me over the phone because you're interpreting what I'm saying and saying Bible. But anyway, <laughs> after the visit, she drove me to Hammersmith, to a car park there. And as, and as we actually, sorry, and as we actually, where we're seated in the car park, about to come out of the car park, Praise the name of the Lord. You can hear that that sounds like a clock ringing in, in the studio. But God bless, it's good. It will be one more time and then it will stop. That should be now. Praise the name of the Lord. It's a very old-fashioned grandfather's clock, isn't it? Nice, though, isn't it? Well, it's all right. As long as you don't have to sleep in the same room, it? it's all right. Because on the hour you'll be woke up. You wouldn't get any sleep at night at all. <laughs> yes, so, 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 anyway, to cut a long story short, to cut a long story short, so we we pulled up in the car and we're going to come out and she's going one way and going the other. But before we come out, she said to me, you know something, Ronald? This week has been an amazing week to me. It's a particular week. Everywhere I go, somebody says something to me about Jesus. So I just keep meeting people. They keep saying things to me about Jesus, 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 Jesus. And then it clicked to my mind 
that maybe that's why Sean said me like that over the phone because people have been all said all week this week people have been coming to her and speaking to her about Jesus and so of course me saying oh God bless you and so forth and, 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 and I see you a friend before you need a friend and, and, and you know and this they can always tell you your friends are in times of need she think I'm quoting but they don't quote parables to me over the phone yeah. they're preaching to over the phone but I wasn't but she said to me in the car we're coming out the car she says to me she, obviously she closed the door but she know Oh, this week, people have been talking to me about Jesus, 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 Jesus. Right. So I don't know why. And they said, you know, somebody said to me today, because I'm showing you how it ties in with being ready to give every man that asks you original hope that is in you with meekness and faith. How important it is for us to know our scriptures, because just by knowing the Bible, back to front, you better to stand up against anybody irrespective of who they are. Because the Bible has all the answers to all the questions that can ever be asked. And that's fact. That is fact. Yeah. Now she said, you know, she says, an Ethiopian chap stopped her and said, Oh, uh, what the Europeans have given us isn't really the true gospel. Because, I'll tell you why, before the church was instituted, um, going back in about the 3rd or 4th century, when the Europeans went to Africa, they found that the people, they already knew Jesus, they knew about Jesus, they knew about the Lord's Supper. Men that were very, very religious Christian people. So how is it then that the Europeans say that they are the ones who are the fathers of, of what we call today modern day Christianity? And now she was looking in a cultural sense, but then I turned around and I said to her, yes, what you're saying is true in a fact because Philip the Evangelist in the book of Acts was an Ethiopian. The Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts was an Ethiopian. On the on the Chinese queen of Ethiopia, he was a true, he was a man that actually worked in, in the treasury house and so forth. Yeah, and sure. Philip, eh? He was an official, and Philip the evangelist actually evangelized him, and then he went back to Ethiopia and spread the gospel. That was in the first century, during the first century church. So so I said that gentleman that said that to you is actually right. Because it wasn't until the third, fourth century when the, when the Catholic Church, you know, laid some foundation when they decided to, to actually unite church and state that they wanted to commit to Christian religion from that point on and call themselves the mother of all churches. They call themselves. But she, I was able to say through knowing the scriptures and what Philip, how Philip preached to the Ethiopian unit and the Ethiopian unit was saved under his ministry that the gospel was being preached and that Africa actually had the gospel before the Europeans went there, which is factual. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So, so as I said, uh, so important. So hey, that's why Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, where he, quote, he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That means know your scriptures, have a good knowledge of the word of God, and be ready always to give an answer. In, others, always, in order to be ready all the time, it means you're going to be always preparing, always practicing in advance just in case a question comes along your way. That's why it says, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You hear that? Yes. So in order to answer someone in meekness and fear and give them the correct answer, you've got to be a diligent student of the word of God. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's continue on. Thank you. Question number six. What did Jesus say about the same thing? St. John 5, 39. Jesus said, search, search the scriptures. So Jesus commanded them to search the scriptures. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And in actual fact, the literal translator version reads like this. Search the scriptures, for in them ye know, for in them ye know ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Let's move on. So Jesus here has commanded that we search the scriptures, book by book, old and new, old and new, comparing old and new, new with old, and so forth. Jesus expects us to search the scriptures uh, all the time and thoroughly. Amen. So we know the scriptures back to front. It, 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 it amazes me many of the times that many people, many young people and older people will go to university and spend three years doing a degree to earn a, level, a living and they'll do serious study for three years but when it comes to the word of God people are very slack and when it comes to the things of God people are generally tend to be very slack and don't take the things of God seriously 
And as Christians, we need to think about this and ponder what I've just said in our hearts. If we want to be an effective tool. Forget about secular work. Secular, you see, when you go to do a nine to five job, that's a secular job. It's secular, it's to our money. It's not as important as delivering the word of God. It's not as important as speaking the word of God. The word of God, see, see when the Lord Jesus Christ saves you from sin, your prerogative has changed. Your prerogative is no longer to seek after the physical things, but the spiritual things which endure forever. And your prerogative, your mission, your calling is to preach the gospel. You see, the man of the world, his secular calling is to grab as much money and as much wealth as he can. And to make himself a big boot, so as, as big as he possibly can in this world. And to stand there and to run and throw himself in front of... Oh, to run and throw him wild stuff in front of anyone they know they can get a good name from or get promotion from. Or to be known by everybody. Oh, I know him. Yes, I know him. Because that makes it feel good. But let them get on with it because that's all they've got. That's their calling. The things of this world. Because all the things we see of this world, like trade, uh, the way people trade, modern ways of trade, modern ways of, 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 of commerce, customs of commerce, these things are all inspired by Satan's kingdom. They're satanic. And that's why there's so much corruption in all levels of society. No matter what kind of people are in, there's corruption within every single government circle. Yeah. There is corruption there. Yes. And in fact, a lot of, and you, 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 you'll be surprised to actually know that there's more corruption in circles that should not be corrupt than corruption in circles that we, that we know are corrupt. Do you, see, do you understand that? Say that again. There is more corruption in circles that should not be corrupt than in circles that we know to be corrupt. Like banks, which are supposed to be safe houses, um, bonds and investments, or whatever the case might be. We're talking about people that are supposed to be trustworthy, uh, trustworthy overlooking the security of, 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 overlooking the security of, of nations, of country, the safety of people and so forth. That are supposed to be in places doing judgment and justice, courthouses and all of these. You know, there's more corruption there and in those type of places than there is in, in, the, in general society. And it's fact. Yes. But our calling as people of God is to preach the gospel. So when we are out doing our 9 to 5, yes, do 9 to 5. But do remember, your calling is not to chase after and lay your life down for the things of this world and die for promotion. All you do when you go to work is do your 9 to 5 and you get out. And if there's an opportunity to witness and drop a word of God here or there, drop your word and then go. You know what I'm saying? I hear you. You drop your word and then you go, right? And then, and then I, your, your prerogative is to dedicate yourself to the study of God's word and to become a student and a true steward of the things of God. Because that is what God has called you to do. So your main focus as a child of God should be on sound doctrine. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Did Paul consider it important to teach doctrine? That's question. Acts chapter 20, verse... Sorry, could you just repeat that again, please? Yes, right I here, then. Did Paul consider it important to teach doctrine? Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 reads, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. So Paul is saying, he's speaking now to pastors. Paul is speaking to ministers. He's saying, watch what you preach. What, watch what you teach. He's saying, take heed, there is. be careful therefore unto yourself. Be careful to yourself. Because you know, a preacher is accountable for what he preaches and teaches. He said, and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. To feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. So, uh, the onus is with church pastors to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. In other words, Jesus Christ has shed his blood for his people, and, he, and the Lord has put onus on us, as preachers, as ministers of God's word, to tr preach the true gospel, the true undiluted, unpolluted word of God. There's an onus on us. To preach it. And when we preach it, we're going to preach it right and preach it properly. And give people sound doctrine. You know, the book of Hosea makes it quite clear and says what? My people are destroyed for what? Lack, Lack of knowledge. knowledge. And because thou hast what? Forsaken what? 
knowledge, I have what? Forsaken, forsaken thee. thee. So to forsake the knowledge of the word of God will result in God himself forsaking us. God expects us to be diligent students of his word. Let's continue on. Thank you. Question number eight. Is it important that the doctrines we believe are scripturally sound? Titus 1 verse 9 reads, Holding fast the faithful word, as he had been taught, that he may be able to buy sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So, in other words, it's important that the doctrine we believe is scripturally sound, so that but with sound doctrine or good doctrine or good teaching, we will be able to both exhort to and convince the gainsayers. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. And also, I'd also like to read to, 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 read to you another scripture there. Um, is that Romans 6, 17? Romans, no, no. Yes, I'll have to read First Timothy chapter one and verse ten, and it says, "For whole whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine." So here, um, the Apostle Paul, that's First Timothy one ten, is warning against uh, poor, the teaching of poor doctrine, and warning people to stay. You know, stay on the word and dedicated to the world. But and also First Timothy chapter three. Sorry, First Timothy chapter six and verse three. And it says, if any man teach otherwise, that's other word, other than the things of God, other than the pure sound word of God, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So again, the Lord expects us um, to adhere to teaching of, of doctrine or teaching that is according to godliness. Okay, I'll pray, praise the name of the Lord. Let's move on from there. Bless Thank his you. name. Question number nine. Does the Bible say anything about false prophets and false doctrine? Matthew 24 verse 11 reads, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. A prophet is supposed to be someone that tells of you know what's happened in the past, what's happening presently, and what's happening to the, in the future. The word prophet in the Greek is actually gobi, which means God's mouthpiece. So the, the Jesus is warning in Matthew 24, which is a prophetic um, scripture. He's warning that in the last days, in the last time, in the last days, last times, false prophets will arise, false pastors, false teachers, and through that will deceive many. Praise the name of the Lord, or praise his holy name, or praise the name of the Lord. And I'd also like to read with you here, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 through to 15. And it reads, And for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming, them, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. So again, you can see, and then I'm going to share one more with you, um, 2 John and verse 7, and it says, For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And there are many other scriptures that I could actually... Um, pinpointer and bring you to in connection with false prophets and false teachers in our time, in our day, and in days gone by of all. Yeah? So so here the the scripture is basically telling us that there are false teachers out there, so Christians should not be gullible. And in actual fact, I just want to um, in fact just quote while we're here, Second Timothy four verse two to four, because I think it's a pretty important scripture. To bring in at this point and it reads as follows preach the word now this word here this scripture timothy was direct oh praise the name of the this word is actually being directed you know with the apostle paul that wrote 
the book of Timothy and he's writing it to Timothy. He's speaking to actual Timothy himself, son his son in the Lord, and advising him. That's correct. And he basically said to Timothy, preach the word. Yeah? Mm -hmm. that, 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 as a pastor, as a minister of God, you've got a, a responsibility before God to preach the word of God flawlessly. So preach the word, be instant in season. That means all the time. Day, night. Summer, winter. At different seasons in your life, whether things are hard, whether things are very smoothly, but you still have a responsibility to preach the gospel. Be instant in season, out of season. So he said, preach in season, preach. whether we want to hear or not, just preach. Reprove, you know, when someone's done wrong, tell them off. Use the word of God to reprove and tell people off. It's a sad thing, but many Christians and many people don't, you know, the Bible said, he who in Proverbs, he who hateth reproof is brutish. The scripture says, he who hateth reproof is brutish. And it's a sad thing to say, but many so-called Christians don't like reproof. You know, whenever you come across a Christian person who doesn't like to be corrected with the word of God, the Bible says, that person is a brute. <laughs> the Bible says, that person is brutish. Because wrong, uh, Proverbs says, he that hateth reproof is what? Brutish. Brutish. You see? Now the word of God is also for reproof. Reproof is to give someone a good telling off. And as a, as a responsible minister of God, you've got, you've got to have enough guts and backbone within you to tell, to give people a good telling off where it's merited. Because God holds you accountable to straighten people out when they're going off, of course. Praise the name of the Lord. And if one goes and leaves, God will send you back ten to replace that one member. And ten better members. You know, my mom has always said of a word, you know, and it's true. You've got to keep your seat in Zion. Because when you get out of that seat, someone else will come and sit in it. I'll tell you what, we, while we're here, we had another individual who would actually come and do our radio program for us. And so forth. And you know, he got up out of the seat. And look, you're in the seat now, Brother Ian. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Because people, God can replace people like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, and it's a false belief to believe that a person is irreplaceable. Because God, because it's, it, it's, it, it's God's work and God's work and God's church will always go on. We look at Judas. Yeah. And he was moved out of the way. And yeah. then we had Barnabas yeah. coming to his place. That's right. No problem at all. That's right, because we had, uh, you know, someone who'd come in and do the radio and so forth. And, and so forth. And then he got up out of this year, and then almost immediately he got up. In fact, before he got up, you came in and you've replaced him. Because God knows things before they happen. Yeah. And that's why my mom has always said, keep your seat in Zion. Don't allow someone else to come and sit in the seat that God yeah. has appointed you to put in. That's yeah. keep your seat in Zion. Yeah. Don't let no, because you see, there's a reward for the faithful, you know. And many people will lose, many Christians will lose their reward because they have not been faithful. And God has had to actually replace them with someone else. I want to tell you something. In all the roles within the church, every, if I tomorrow was not there anymore, God would replace me tomorrow. Yeah. In fact, he replaced me today before I even went, he replaced me. <laughs> My replacement will be sitting in the church looking at me. And then as soon as I come out, they take over. That reminds me of the Medes and the Persians. Yes. That very same night. Yeah. Both the shadow was removed. <coughs> that's the right. The Persians they took him over. Same night. And that's how. So, so that's why we have to serve God with fear because I was God. With fear and trembling because our God, he's a consuming fire. In fact, Pastor Ronnie, before the judgment actually took him, yeah. they were coming in. That's right. <laughs> On the, way in. the Lord works very fast. So by the time his knees were up and everything else, he was on the way. They the were in. They were in. Yeah. Oh and then he got an hour left to leave. <laughs> and then moved him out of the way. They just slotted in. That's right. Oh is it? So they preach the word. Be instant in season. Out of season. Reprove. Rebuke me. Reprove is harsh right. The, the word reprove means to set somebody set somebody right. Straighten yes. them up when they're yes. going wrong. Oh. Rebuke means a good telling off. Yeah. Yeah, exhort, exhort means to strengthen as well, strengthen them as well, with all long suffering. So pastors do this for all long time and keep doing it. And doctrine, and using Jesus. teaching. He's also saying give the brethren teaching. You know, there are some churches that all they do is sing, you know, and shout and hallelujah. But that's good, but the, the people also need teaching. You, you can't run a church 
We don't have the word of God. No, you no, need no. teaching. Yeah. So if you're attending a church and teaching is not there, leave and come to us and we'll teach you the sound, <laughs> give you the sound and pure milk of the word. Amen. Yes? It, for a time will come when we will not endure sound doctrine. Yeah. Sound that's true teachings. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. You see, when teaching is taken away, you know, we know the word, yeah. the, the, the paragraphs here, where teaching is taken away, then the ears are turned away from the truth. You see? Because and shall be turned yeah. onto fables. Where sound doctrine is not being taught, then the, the, the resulting factor is fables. What's being preached is fables. And in fact, in many churches today, what is actually being preached is fables. fables yes. And in fact, they've become... Many churches are no, nothing more than large social gatherings or social clubs. Yeah. Nothing more. Something somewhere to go on a Saturday or Sunday yeah, or nice, during the week. Yeah, nice or somewhere to go and sit down and relax for a couple of hours. That's all right. Day, amen. Again, enjoy some. No. These are the Bible. It, and so that's not a, a church is a place where sound doctrine is being taught. Yeah. Praise the name of the Lord. Continue. Thank you. Question number 10. Does history prove that there was a falling away? from the pure teaching of the Bible. Well, f now, now I'm quoting this from uh, the book entitled The Growth of the Christian Church by R. H. Nichols. The Growth of the Ch Christian Church by R. H. Nichols. Um, very popular, you can find it on the, over the internet. They're up in Google, they're, they're in the archives, you can find it there. Uh, page 87, no, uh, quote I read, Thus within the church there was a great mass of paganism or pagan ideas around religion and morals and pagan ways of action carried over by these people who were Christians only in name and form. Saint worship is the chief example of this tendency. The saints became sorry, the saints became to be regarded as something like lesser deities or lesser gods yes. whose intercession availed God. Places connected with the lives of these saints were considered especially sacred. Pilgrimages to such places naturally followed. To venerate relics or material objects connected with the saints, parts of their bodies or properties, and to believe that in them was the power to perform miracles came easily to those in whom superstition still remained. Now, while we're there, I'd also like to add this to that in that there are a group of ministers and they're, and they're growing in number even as we speak who are now carrying carrying along with them under their clothes under their t-shirts um lucky charms <laughs> and no 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 let's no and these are pastors and many of them are well-known pastors which i will not name lucky they charms. carry yes they carry around the cross and underneath it's got kind of a hex on it and they say it gives them, brings them protection against devils and evil spirits. So when they cast out spirits, it won't be, it's like a protection icon. Yeah. And in fact, at my place of employment, a senior social worker was trying to order, order the same um, charm for all of us in the office. But I said, don't get one for me, I don't want one. And I turned my ears when we were talking about it. Because they're using it in the, in the team dances and it's really working. People get so much success and luck when they wear these things. Now, there's a growing number of Christian pastors in the UK and beyond who are actually wearing this under their clothes. And many of these pastors are age-old pastors that have been going from the were 30 and they're now in their 70s or 80s. And they're now wearing these under their clothes. You see, this is all superstition. Yes. Uh, and it's actually occultic practices where people are actually bringing in themselves charms and images to protect themselves from the powers of the devil. This is going back to superstition and occultic and pagan practices which in effect were practiced in the early churches. And so many times when people take things back to themselves like holy water and also holy anointed oil in bottles, it's a very dangerous thing when people give you those things to carry home with you and to take it, they use this and all of that. You've got to be sure where that oil is coming yes, from, yes. who's prayed over the oil, yes. what, what that person's ideology is, and if, they, if, at all, if that holy water is coming from a venerated place, like in Lourdes or wherever, where, where these people go, and all that, where they pray from that water, where, where the Virgin Mary appear and all that. 
because many of these sources are actual and we're repeated demonic and satanic yes. and so the, the scripture also advises us that we should not bring into our houses the cursed thing lest we would also become a curse so it's so important and very important what we wear on our bodies and what we bring to us that we don't bring into our houses anything that's a curse and that will bring a curse upon ourselves and upon our family praise the name of the lord Amen. you know the bible says the curse will not cause this come oh praise the name of the lord so it's very important what we bring into our house or what we allow to be sprinkled in our house or around our house because many of these things will bring a curse or allow entrance to demons in our spirits or into our into our place of dreading now let's continue on now the, the reading from the same book again and um, the distinction between clergy and laymen unknown in the third unknown in the first century was gradually marked the office of the bishop bishop was magnified and authoritative power was centralized at the imperial capital don't get me wrong the church has always had bishops james was the first he was a peter but it wasn't peter James, the half brother of Jesus, was the first bishop in the church. Yeah, in the early church. Um, so the church has always had bishops, but they're saying they they venerated these people like pastors and, and priests like, as saints. Hence, that's why people bow to priests, ask forgiveness of priests, oh, yes. because they oh, yes. see them almost as deity, yes. which is shocking. Yes, which is man worship. Yes. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. More liturgies, liturgies, and forms of prayers were produced. Church builders became larger and more decorative. Church walls were covered with paintings and mosaics and embroideries. Dignity and impressiveness were sought in the service as well as stately ritual and solemn music. That's pages 59 and 60 from the same book. In worship, the central feature was the Mass, as a sacrament of the Lord's Supper was now usually called. Yeah? So the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was turned into the Mass. Yes. Christianity became a religion of fear. The world was thought to be full of devils who sought to injure men's bodies and souls. Thus charms, and we talked about charms earlier on, uh -huh. certain venerated pastors within the Pentecostal movement and churches wearing lucky charms and so forth and bangles, bracelets and things on their shirts and rings and so forth to bring them protection and from demons. Ah, uh, yes, promoting. Yes, yes and you've, you've seen I've it. I've seen it. Oh, yeah, on, on, on TV. <laughs> yes. It's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the sad thing is, yes, and he was promoting it on TV. I mean, one of our church members, <laughs> she brought him to me um, a chain with a cross and I'm on it. I said, come from a side and pass over the TV. I said, she wears his nose through to a I said, it's rubbish, throw it in the bin. <laughs> Absolutely. Because a lot of them are doing that and it is wrong. You see, 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 thus charms, you see, thus charms became to be, began, became to be worn. And an, un and an awful sanctity was attributed to church buildings, the mass, relics, yes. and the persons of the clergy. In other words, priests became like God. You no longer pray to Jesus, you pray to the priest, mate. Yeah. You no longer ask Jesus for forgiveness, you ask the priest for forgiveness, mate. You see, that's what's the falling away. Yes. Stories were told and believed how disrespect to clergy was followed by calamity and death. Christianity took such a form that was far removed from the simplicity and spirituality and joyful trust of the religion and faith of Jesus. Yes. It'd be page 93. Continue. Beautiful. Question number 11. Thank you for that. Are we at liberty to believe only certain portions of the Bible and can we add doctrines that are not in the Bible? Deuteronomy 4 verse 2 reads, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Also Revelation 22 18 and 19 and it reads for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book if any man shall add unto these things God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in the book so here God expects us to know the book inside and out, both old and new, to apply ourselves to, to it and not to add or remove anything from the word. And it actually sends a shiver down my spine where pastors now 
have got their own versions of the Bible. Have you come across it? Yes, many. Like such and such. Many, 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 <laughs> many, many of them. And different colours as well. And it almost makes me laugh. Kind of <laughs> you go, yeah, and where, where, where various parts of the ministers have actually redesigned and reshaped the Bible and got their own versions out with all commentaries in the bottom of the Bible at the front of the This is so dangerous. And they've it? actually put their name they on the front of their name on the front of many of these Bibles. Like X X Y Z Bible yeah. Manual or X Y Z Bible yeah. Prophecy Bible or X Y Z Prayer or X Central or X Y Z Evangelical Bible. They've done it. I think that's shocking. Because to do that, you've got to be do, doing some tampering somewhere. Because every individual has a slightly different ideology, even though we're all Christians. And many times, some of that can actually filter into that work. So it's a dangerous practice. And I always look on these things with suspicion. Praise the and name of the Lord. The, the quantity of different translations. Now, have you noticed that all these translations that come along now just water everything down? In fact, it's they're so watered down. In fact, and we, no meaning. In fact, on, on, on the national TV, they had a problem. I can't remember what side it was on. <laughs> And it was about Bibles, and they read a, one of the latest modern Bibles, and it was slang Bible, basically. And I don't know if you saw Ridiculous. the program, no, and it was so bad, it was so awful. It was so awful what they've written down the place in me. Because they, they, they read like a, a, a scripture like John 3, 16, like from the King James, 1611 version. And then for the most modern Bible, they read it and interpreted it, and it was absolutely shocking. It sounded nothing like that, the original, and neither did it taste like the original either. And there was no, you couldn't connect with it, you couldn't feel anything, you couldn't draw any power or any spirituality from this modern one. Well, it's clear in the word that those folks are in danger. Yeah. But what I looked at as well is there was a particular Bible, I won't mention names or anything else, whatever, but it was a, a particular denomination and they had a youth Bible. Yeah. Um, and one day I decided out of curiosity just to have took some of it and it was, it was rubbish. Yeah, yeah. In effect, I mean, they call it the Holy Bible. Yeah. But it was absolute rubbish. And in my spirit I thought to myself, what is this? What I was reading, there was no relation yeah. ship to the word of God in what I was reading, yet yeah. I claimed as a holy bible. Mm -hmm. I mean this was ten years ago. But now you go to a lot of these prominent websites and they say right, read the Bible online. Mm -hmm. And the amount of versions that have come along mm -hmm. and you just see what are these people No, doing? I, and, it, and it's, it's very it. dangerous because it makes it more difficult to memorise verses of scripture. Because when we have one concise version of the Bible, like the King James, yes. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Or St. John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and verse 2, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. Right, now, where, you, where you've got so many other versions, you make it difficult to memorize what scriptures are being quoted. Because when, I, when, you know, when you can listen to a radio or any other thing, and you hear them quote, I say, oh, I'm quoting from Timothy 3.15. And when you listen, right? it doesn't sound right. You think, what is, is it? Right? It, it? It brings a time of a confusion in yes. your soul. It kind of tries to draw you away from the meat and from the truth that is in the Word of God. I and that's a fact. The Bible says that there's great judgment coming for those who tamper with the Word of God. We don't have the authority yes. and we don't have the divine authority to tamper with God's Word. So, so people that... So people that are doing that are in danger in of trouble. losing their eternal salvation. Judas Iscariot lost his. Yes. Praise the name of the Lord. And as you're speaking there, I, um, some time ago I bought this um, little book and it was um, literally filled with scripture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's scripture divided into several different topics, yeah. which was very, very handy so you could learn to, you know, speak the word according to a topic or an issue. Or yeah. Cool, I excellent. So I bought it, looking forward to reading this thing now. I opened it up, what version was in it? Mm. The NIV version. Yeah, yeah. And then what other version was in it? The Amplified version. Yeah, yeah. It made no sense to me. And to this very day, yeah. I've had to put it down. Yeah. It's on my shelf right now, doing nothing at all. Yeah. And it was sad, because in my heart, I, I personally believe, and from my experience, I've come to understand the power, I feel the power mm. in the King James Version yeah. Bible. No, so in all in all honesty, wherever you go, you have to at some point come back to the King James Version. Yes, that's correct. And all of these other versions to me are just simply yeah. they're not even go they're not even go because they they um, they a less lesser substitute. Mm -hmm. They're nowhere near equal to the King James Version. Mm -hmm. And to this very day, I just could not come to grips with what I was reading. Mm -hmm. Although I know the scriptures like Psalm 23 and all these other scriptures, 
but it made no sense. It didn't have any power. I couldn't connect to it. And I had to literally put it down. So what I did is I just took the topics and went and used the King James version and got the scriptures and did it. Yeah, you, that, that's right, that's right. Okay, and let's just fire on off question number 12 and let's um, close this session up. Okay, question number 12. How is the true church described? <coughs> Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, and it reads, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Also, Revelation 19, 7 to 9, um, it reads, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, white, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Uh, praise the name of the Lord. The church is described as, as, as one, praise the name of the Lord, as um, metaphorically speaking, in, in the same light as oh, the wife of Christ, yes? Yes. Um, in, in categorically like, or, or metaphorically, um, as clean, it should be holy, sh g glorious, holy, glorious, praise the name of the Lord, without blemish, without spot. The wife is also described as, 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 as a body that has made itself ready for the Lord, um, dressed in righteousness, clean and white, righteousness of the saints. And the church is also described as blessed people who are blessed by the Lord and who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, and the end of um, Revelation 19, last clause of verse 9, it said, These are the true sayings of God. So I hope you've enjoyed the teaching. We are the Apostolic Church of God, Seventh Day, um, coming to you live on Radio Chris Cabri. We worship every Saturday at the Church of St. Michael and St. George, which is number one, Commonwealth Avenue, White City Estate, Shepherds Bush, London, W127QR. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Seven QR. Yes. We're there every Saturday from one till around one till around five thirty. Joyous worship, joyous praise. Maybe it was all oh, this a long time run. No, it's not long. When you're in the presence of the Lord, you enjoy every second. God bless you. Signing out. Praise the Lord. Amen.